Okay, welcome back to the Quantum Science Seminar. This is episode 17. It's all going to be about doing computations with lasers. And as usual, we would like to have your questions. Please send us your questions via email to quantumscienceseminar at gmail.com or use the uh, YouTube live chat at the right or at the bottom of the screen. We are, as usual, going to take a uh, break somehow halfway through the talk uh, where we're going to answer some of your questions, if there are any already, and then answer the rest of your questions at the very end. We, as you know, typically get many more questions than we can answer, but don't worry, our speaker today has kindly agreed to answer them in written form, and he will also stay on afterwards in our private uh, Zoom meeting to which all of you will be invited, and I will post the uh, Zoom link at the end of the talk into the YouTube live chat. So stay tuned and you can get to know our speaker and interact uh, with us if you like. Uh, with this, um, I'd like to hand over to Ofer and please note, as usual, we have about a 30 second time delay between what you see on YouTube and between what we're doing here. That, Ofer, please. Thank you, Sebastian. And good afternoon, everyone. It is a special pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, Professor Neil Davidson. Professor Davidson is the Dean of the Faculty of Physics at the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. He studies ultra-cold quantum gases, nowadays Bose Fermi mixtures, and he is known for his measurements of the excitation spectrum of a Bose-Einstein condensate and the chaotic dynamics of atomic billiards. Neil also studies hot and cold atom interferometers, slow and stored light, and for many years, the synchronization of lasers and laser networks, which is the topic of today's seminar. Before joining the Weizmann Institute, that's uh, 26 years ago, Neil did his postdoc with Steve Chu in Stanford, where he worked on the last steps towards BEC, that is uh, optical dipole traps and evaporative and Raman cooling. And beforehand, well, he went to high school, which apparently is the same high school I went to. So with that, Neil, thank you for coming. And the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Ofer, for this uh, extensive uh, <laughs> past introduction. And thank you very much for all the organizers for allowing me uh, to be here and to present our work in this really fantastic series. Uh, I want to uh, tell you today uh, about uh, our work, uh, how to solve uh, computational problems, related problems with coupled lasers. Uh, there's a line below coupled lasers. I'll spend the first slide to introduce the system of coupled laser, and then the next slide to tell you what kind, what the kind of computational problem we are interested in. Before that, I would like to thank my collaborators, not to forget. So the group members, current ones, are Simon, Igor, Sagi, Naresh, and Geva. Uh, below, in a little bit faded color, are the people that finished and faded from Weizmann. This is Ken, Ronen, Vishva, Micha, Eitan, and Micha. And below that is uh, Oren Raz and Asher Friedem, who are uh, my collaborators from Weizmann. So to get a feeling of the system, what is, uh, cup, what is the coupled laser system that I'm, I'm going to use, I'm showing you here a, a picture of 1,500 laser. Each one of these spots is a laser coming out of the screen toward you. They are arranged on a square uh, lattice. Uh, and uh, in this middle picture, I show you the diffraction, the scattering pattern, what we call in optics the far field, when the lasers are uncoupled. And as you know, when the lasers are uncoupled, each laser has a random phase relative to the other. So in the far field, you have to add the intensity of all each laser. And because each laser is small, in the far field, something which is small becomes large. So each laser has a large diffraction pattern. And you just sum 1,500 of those, and you get this large pattern. However, if you couple the laser, and you, phase, you lock the phase of all the lasers to be the same, which is what I will discuss today, then you will get this far field diffraction pattern, which is now composed of these very sharp Bragg peaks. Uh, you would get the same picture if you just send a, a plane wave through a mask that looked like that. It would be the zero diffraction order. This would be the first diffraction order. And the area of this peak is 1,500 times smaller than the area of these scattered light. So we get actually 1,500 times more light intensity in this region, even though the total power is the same because we are able to concentrate. So this relates to the basic motivation people use for many years, why they want to phase lock and to couple lasers to just get this sharp peak. And I'm going to give a, an original reference to this work by Lucas et al, which if you want to destroy a planet with the laser, you want to take many strong lasers. And probably here, 
this is where the phase locking is occurring. But what I want to uh, talk about today is how to use this concept of phase locking the laser in order to solve computational problem. And uh, to motivate you for that, I'm going to show you a little bit later that there's a very close link between the phase distribution of the lasers. This is like a zero pi, zero pi distribution that we'll see later and the orientation of these XY spins. And I will show you that this strong link can be used, of course, the spin system, finding the ground state of a spin a Hamiltonian is linked to a large variety of computational problem like Maxka traveling agent. So by using this intermediate mapping, we're going to use our lasers, our dissipative uh, system in order to find ground states of Hamiltonian and through them to solve computational problem. So this is uh, what we aim to do today. And this is part of a say larger community who's interested in this concept, which is called coherent computing. So I want to give you a few, few slides, just the main idea of, of what we are going to do. So what is the optimization problem? You, you want to find the value of a, the a parameter that minimizes the value, like the time it takes a traveling agent to go through city. I'm showing here one parameter, but in typical problem, you have many parameters, like 100 cities where the traveling agent is going, or in our case, 1500 lasers, so I, ha I would have to plot this in a 1500 dimension Hilbert space. So remember, I'm only showing you one cross section. And typically, easy problems look like that. So to minimize the value, uh, usually you have this smooth uh, uh, concave function. And if I start with an initial gash, there are many reasons, many ways that I could find the, the global minima. Hard problems, uh, uh, as opposed, the value as a function of all these parameters, again, remember that there are, there are say 1000 parameters, has this complex landscape. So you are looking for the global minima, but you have many, many different local minima that you can get stuck in. Actually, it's hypothesized that you have an exponentially large number or scaling of the local minima as the function of your parameter. This is what makes the problem hard to solve. And in addition, if this is not enough, it is again speculated that the distance between the global minima, the, the real minimization that you are interested in, and the false minima, one of these local minima, could also scale exponentially with the size of the system. So to find the, the correct minima as opposed to the approximation might be very, very hard. Uh, we are going to use a laser system. In the laser system, the value is mapped to the loss. The loss uh, represents a dissipation to the system. We have a non-unitary system. We have a loss, which depend on the values, which are in our case, the laser phase. So we have 1500 directions. We have 1500 phases of the laser and they define the loss for each point in this Hilbert space. And what we want is the system to dissipate itself to the minimal loss solution. Uh, the first advantage over say unitary system like called atoms or others is that you don't have to cool the system to the ground state, but you can at least hope that the system would dissipate itself to the ground state like this little ball was doing just now. So you don't have to come uh, uh, from afar. It still remains uh, to overcome the problem that you can still get stuck in this local minima, especially that this system is usually overdamped. So in order to solve that, there was a very nice idea introduced by the Yamamoto group. And they said, in a laser system, you have a loss and you have a gain. So let's take the gain to be lower than any loss in any phase distribution. In, under this condition, if, of course, you don't know this uh, um, landscape, that's the problem you try to solve, but just take the gain low enough. So it's lower than any loss. And if you do that, the system cannot laze. So it exists in a state of, let's say, spontaneous emission. There are some debates about what is exactly how, what is the right way to describe this phase, but let's do it intuitively. Let's say that in this spontaneous emission, the phase either fluctuates very fast between different values or coexists between different values, depending what presentation you want. So you have, in some sense, you have a combination of all the possible solutions. And they would compete over the game in a process called mode competition, which is exponentially strong. If you're a little bit stronger than the other one, you can win over exponentially. This is the basic property of lasers. The next step is to increase the gain ever so slowly. And that is already a weak point. How slowly? Maybe you have to do it exponentially slowly. If you remember adiabatic quantum computation. So this is remain to be studied. But if you do it slow enough, the moment that you touch 
the minimal loss solution. This is the global ground state, not one of these local ones. This state now has gain equal loss. It will start to amplify to build a macroscopic coherent population. And that would win over all the other states exponentially. So now you can read the state because it becomes macroscopic. If you're not careful, you'll go a little bit up and you may populate wrong state. So this is the main idea. And this led, uh, uh, for example, the Yamamoto group to come up with this very influential paper. They took a uh, hundred uh, uh, um, uh, pulses. They used OPOs and OPOs have only phase of zero and pi. So they could make them uh, to Ising uh, spin. They call it the Ising machine. They even put it in a nice box built by NTT. And now you can even run programs on the internet and compete between them and D-Wave. Uh, so he, this is becoming a, a hot topic. Um, this is sometimes called annealing machine, or if you want quantum inspired computing machines. I put D-Wave alone with a nice picture because they are uh, in the business for some time. But as you can see recently, OPOs, laser, uh, polariton BCs, uh, photonics, electronics, even micro droplets. And of course, cold atoms use these concepts indirectly for many experiments. You use dissipation to lead you to the desired ground state of the system. You have to engineer the dissipation. So in this talk, I will concentrate on the work done by us in Weizmann. And there's also a startup company started by two of our own Weizmann students that is also trying to put this uh, uh, concept into a uh, reality. So what I'm going to show you how we can simulate XY spins and via them to solve problem. And uh, then I will show you that in many cases, actually the mapping between the lasers and the XY spins is not full, is not complete. So you can go beyond XY. Uh, if I have time, I will show a, a different set of problems, but that probably will not happen. So I'll start very, very simply, just to remind us all, what do we mean when we say that we have phase locking? Uh, so if you take normally two lasers and you interfere them on the screen, you will not see uh, fringes because there's relative phase fluctuation unless your lasers are extremely stable. Uh, but if you couple them and the coupling is dissipative, you can get a constant phase shift between the lasers. So even though each one of the phases still fluctuates, the relative phase can stay constant, say, throughout the day, and you will see these stable interference fringes. This is our goal. I'll show a few ways to couple the laser. The, probably the simplest one, it just happened by itself. So let's consider this system. I'm considering these two lasers and I'm already hinting that I'm going to put them in a common resonator. So here are the two mirrors of the common resonator. This is the gain, in our case, it's a neodymium YA gain. And in order to define the laser, I'm simply putting a mask and I put two holes in the mask. So there's a, the red mode and the green mode, they go back and forth and because of diffraction, they spread a little bit and they overlap. Okay, and when the modes overlap, they are coupled. Notice that this uh, coupling, uh, in this case, if these are Gaussian modes, the coupling is an overlap between two Gaussian fields, which is a Gaussian by itself. So this is short range coupling. It's only the nearest neighbor. If I have another laser here, it's going to be exponentially smaller uh, coupling. And also note that the coupling is dissipative. Uh, you can see that because you can see that the loss here on this little piece depends on the relative phase between the two lasers. We can already guess that the minimal loss solution would be when we have here destructive interference. Let's do it. So if I have pi phase between these two modes, they will destructively interfere here on this metal blockade, and that would minimize the loss, and then we could see the interference fringe between them. So the coupling has to be dissipative, and mode competition will select from all the possible relative phases between the two lasers, the one that minimizes loss, and here we could actually guess the solution easily. As I said, we want not two lasers, but many lasers. So we replace the mask with two holes by another mask with 1500 holes that I show you in the beginning. Okay, so now we have 1500 lasers. And of course, as they go back and forth in our cavity, they spread and they couple in a very complicated way. So we want to start by having a non-coupled laser. And this is a little bit of a challenge. And the way we do that is we put a telescope inside the cavity. So we have here a 4F telescope, F, 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 and then back forth. And what this telescope is doing, it takes the field distribution coming out of each one of these holes, and it images, it images it uh, after 4F and reverse images back. So it images it back upon itself. And this makes the lasers to be independent as, as long as they are not overlapping on the game. And, and this uh, very strange cavity has a name. It's called the generate laser cavity. 
It was invented in the 60s. This is probably the worst laser cavity that you will ever see because the light coming out of it will be completely incoherent. And actually you can quantify that by asking how many degenerate modes, because all these modes are degenerate, exist in this laser. And uh, we recently did an experiment where we could actually count these modes, it's not so easy. And we found out that we have uh, almost half a million independent modes. So when you have a multi-mode cavity, sometimes you mean you have 10 modes or 100 modes, we have something like half a million modes, which can always, in spite of mode competition, because they are strictly degenerate. And this is going to be our resource, controlling these degenerate modes and shaping them and choosing the one with minimal loss is our strategy to solve problems. Okay, let's see if it works. So this is the uncoupled system. So everything is well aligned and the lasers are uncoupled. This I already showed you. You know that they are uncoupled because when you look on the far field, you see just the sum of intensity. You don't see any sign of interference. In order to couple them, you have to allow a little bit of diffraction. Let's do that. Let's move this mirror away just a little bit. And now the, these modes are overlapping here. The imaging is not perfect. And we see this uh, sharp diffraction peak. Whenever we see sharp diffraction peak, we know that the diffraction peak there is a structure factor. This is the Fourier transform of the correlation function. So basically, when I see a diffraction limited peak, I know that the coherence is across the entire array. Saying it differently, the area of this peak is about a thousand times smaller than this area. So all the lasers in the array are now phase locked. We also see that it's dark in the center, which means that this is actually the, the structure factor is concentrated on the edges of the brilliant zone. And this means that the phases are organized as zero pi, zero pi, which shouldn't surprise us because we already agreed the two nearby lasers want to be pi phase away in order to have destructive interference on the mass in between them. So this is what we would expect. Let's move this uh, uh, output coupler, this mirror, a little bit more. And now we see positive coupling. So you see the same system, just by moving the mirror a little bit, can have 0 pi, 0 pi as its minimal loss solution, or can have uh, this 0, 0, let's say, ferromagnetic ordering, where the peak here is in the center, as I showed you before. To give you a little bit more intuition why we get positive coupling here, in spite of the, this mask, uh, I, I'm now going to add that the distance which I put the mirror in order to get this uh, scaling is half of the Talbot distance. And if you remember the Talbot effect from your high school, you remember that at the Talbot distance, because we go back and forth, so half and half is one, you get the two pi difference between this uh, uh, node and that node. If you calculate this length and this length at the Talbot distance back and forth, you get two pi or lambda difference. And that means that the light going from the laser back to itself and the light it gets from the neighbor accumulates a phase of two pi, which is just like zero. And this gives you the zero phase or the positive coupling between them. In this example, the, the distance was a quarter of the Talbot and the phase, this length difference was lambda over two. So we got pi. So you can think about the minimal loss or think about this constructive interference. Of course, because of total energy conservation, they have to agree with each other. By the way, we can move this uh, lens to arbitrary distances where the phase accumulated would be neither zero nor pi, but something in between. And this would correspond to complex coupling. So the coupling function is going to be complex rather than real. And this can be used, and we have now an experiment doing it, to impose artificial gauge fields on the system. But I do not have time to show it today. Another thing that we can do here, we infer the phase distribution from the far field picture. You can do that in simple cases. In more complicated phases, you actually want to measure the phase directly. And because this is light, not atoms, it's very easy because the light interferes very easily. So what we do, we take one of these lasers, this one, and we expand it and we interfere it with all the lasers in the array. And we see these interference fring fringes that you can see the magnify. And each one of these interference patterns tells us what is the relative phase, say between this laser and this laser, and the contrast of these fringes tell us what is the amount of coherence between them. And when we apply, when we analyze these uh, uh, interference patterns, we can get, for example, for the negative coupling that we saw here, we get this phase distribution. You see there's a long range ordering, you see this phase uh, from the central one, and you see this color blue, red, blue, red, this corresponds to the zero pi, zero pi. So we can really measure the exact state of the system. Let me go back to the point I mentioned in the beginning, which is that uh, there is a connection between the lasers and spin. So in order to establish this connection, I want to make an approximation. I want to freeze 
all the degrees of freedom of each one of the lasers, and there are many, believe me, there's the intensity, the polarization, the exact wavelengths, there might be internal structure. We assume we have a perfect single mode, Gaussian mode of each laser, and then, of course, classical description, and then the laser will be fully characterized by its complex phase, which is a number between zero and two pi. In this case, zero pi, zero pi. And then we can draw this number as a little arrow, and we can call it a spin. So at least uh, on the picture of it, and then we would call this an antiferromagnetic configuration. So there seems to be an analogy between the XY spin and the coupled lasers, if you freeze all the degrees of freedom. And the question, is it an analogy? Is it more than that? And the answer is actually quite surprising. It's more than an analogy. There is a mathematical identity between the equation describing the coupled laser system under these approximations. And by the way, when I freeze all the degrees of freedom, I can only write an equation for the phase. And this is quite a famous equation that some of you may have heard about it. It's called the Kuramoto model. It describes couple systems and couple oscillators like people walking on bridges and birds singing in the forest and many other things. Uh, and, and this is how it looks. And when you look on the classical XY model, you have the coupled spins and you have some coupling matrix, let's say the same one. And now the statement is that the ground state of the classical XY model and the lowest fixed point, or the most stable fixed point of the Koramuto are identical. Okay, if you find this, by this uh, minimal loss uh, criteria, you find the ground state of the XY model. So this is not an analogy, this is identity of the ground state, not of the dynamic, not of the relaxation process, but of the ground state, where this is of course unitary system, and this is a non-unitary system which dissipates itself to this minimal loss solution. So we seem to have this uh, uh, train. We start with the minimal loss state. This should get us to the Koromuto stable fixed point under this approximation. And this is already an established connection to the uh, minimal energy of the XY. So we seem to be okay. Our laser system will find the ground state of the XY, except there's a recent paper by us <laughs> uh, that shows that there is a problem. And the problem is that these two states would not map unless these conditions hold. And, you can, and let's just take one example. Will the lasers be of uniform intensity? Of course, you know, in the XY, all the arrows are the same lengths. So we have to uh, compare with lasers with equal intensity. Now the lasers can be of non-equal intensity because of problems, technical non-uniformity, but let's assume that all the lasers are strictly identical. Will they have uniform intensity? And the answer shown in this uh, red color, they will not inherently. I could prove it to you by example, but let me prove it to you by sort of negative argument. If this mapping would be correct, it is not. Then I could take the minimal loss solution, I only have to diagonalize a matrix of the coupled laser. This is easy. To solve the XY problem under general coupling is an NP-hard problem. So an easy problem and an NP-hard problem cannot be mapped. This is the simplest argument that I want to present here. This is why this problem, and now the question is how you overcome, how you make this mapping, how you impose the uniform intensity of the lasers, and, and this is work in progress, okay? So, so already at this stage, we see that the mapping between the lasers and the XY is not full, if you take into account additional degrees of freedom, which you have to. Um, Let's, there are some conditions where you can do the mapping. For example, if you walk high above threshold, then the intensities are quite the same. You can see in this example. So we took a triangular lattice. We let the laser find the minimal loss solution of the XY Hamiltonian. This is, by the way, known with negative coupling between nearest neighbors. So it cannot be zero pi because a triangle is said to be zero minus 120 plus 120. And this is what the laser does. This is the far field distribution. And you see these a sharp points, the laser found long range order, and this is the correct solution. Uh, this is another example, this is called Kagome lattice. So you still have triangles, but now they touch only at corners. This is how it looks. When you look on the far field, you see something which is strikingly different than this. You don't see sharp peaks. So something is failing here. Why? And the answer is actually quite fundamental. The reason why you cannot find the ground state, there's just too many. Actually, there are exponentially many degenerate ground states for Kagome lattice at the XY with negative coupling. Intuitively, it comes from the fact that each triangle can have two degenerate solutions. And then when you, because they're only touching at one point and only nearest neighbor, then you have two solutions here, two solution here. So you have two to the power of the number of triangles, two to the power of 500 degenerate ground states. And, and this is what the system is done, being frustrated. 
Uh, and, and what I'm showing you here is a theoretical calculation done many, many years ago for this kind of magnetic structure, Kagome lattices by Mosner and Choker, two famous people in the field. And this is what they calculated as the structure factor scattering, say, neutrons from this uh, uh, polarized neutrons. And you can see that what our laser measure and what they predicted theoretically is actually quite similar, even in details. This is called bow type. It's quite famous. What they could not do and we can do very easily in our system is, for example, introduce just a little bit of next nearest neighbor coupling. You see that if this and this laser would couple, then I would break the degeneracy and I would get some kind of a single uni a ground state. And we do that. We introduce just a little bit of next nearest neighbor coupling and the diffraction pattern again regains these sharp peaks. Um, I'm a little bit behind time. Um, so things seem to work, and the mapping to XY seems to work, but let me tell you another sort of complicated aspect of our system. I'm showing you now the spectrum of a single laser. And what you see, these spikes are longitudinal mode, they are different frequency. It turns out that each one of these 1500 lasers is a zoo containing about 500 frequencies. Okay, so you have a complicated system, 1500 lasers, each one has several hundred frequencies, and now you have to analyze those. Fortunately, this is quite simple. Because what we actually have, we have each one of these frequencies longitudinal mode among the 1500 laser is an experiment. So we actually have a few hundred independent experiment and the result that we observe is an ensemble average of them in a single shot. Which in some cases it's even good because you can do what is called proper sampling. Uh, so let's see what the manifestation. If I take this is a triangular lattice with positive coupling. This is the far field diffraction pattern that we measure. And uh, the, the, this has a single uh, minimal energy. So even though we have hundreds of experiments, they all get the same phase distribution. So when you average over all these phases, which you have to do to find out what is the coherence function, you actually get the same. So this is the uh, contrast, the magnitude of the coherence. This is the phase. You see the phase is uniform. And you can just say that all of them do the same. If I take the triangle with the negative coupling, as you can see here, this, this is negative coupling, zero in the center. Now you have two degenerate solution. On each one of these triangles, you can have positive or negative vortex. So among these hundreds of experiments, hundreds of frequencies, some of them would choose this ground state, maybe half. The other half would choose this ground state. And what you see is actually an average between these two, uh, these two populations. This population and that population, this leads to some funny issues. For example, you can see that the coherence is not a monotonic function. So I lose coherence from one to half to my ne nearest neighbor and still half. But when I go to my next next neighbor, the coherence revives to one. This you can see here. So this is the coherence decaying with distance for the in phase where I have this single manifold. And this strange down, down, up, down, down, up. This is the anti, uh, the, the negative coupling. Uh, you can explain this because if you look on, on, on these two different vortices and you ask what happens after you go one, two, three to the third neighbor, you see that you actually regain the same phase. Another sort of strange thing, if you ask what is the phase of the coherence between two lasers, it turns out that it's pi, which actually is quite strange because this is triangular lattice. You're looking for the 120 degrees, but remember this is a, a, a population average between some populations which are 120 and the other one which are minus 120, and this gives you this strange pi. Of course, if you go to the Kagome, now you have these many, many, exponentially many degenerate ground states, and that means that when you average over them, you get an exponentially decaying coherence function, and that is what we measure. So this is a good place, maybe even a little bit uh, after, to stop for question. And uh, to, for your entertainment, I'm showing you a recent experiment we did together with Moti Friedman in Barilan, where instead of coupling the laser, we took 16 violin players. We made sure they don't see and listen to each other. And through this coupling box, uh, we coupled their music and we put them on triangular lattices, square lattice, kagome lattice. Uh, so this is sort of fun. And I'm stopping for questions. OK, Nia. Yeah. Um, we had uh, a question by at least three people, one of them, Bill Phillips, uh, about uh, the difference between what you called, I think, coherent computing and quantum computing. I will read uh, the perfect formulation of Bill. Um, so you have been very careful in, with your language using terms like quantum inspired rather than quantum for the kind of computation being done. A laser is essentially classical. Different lasers are presumably not quantum entangled. So is there a quantum advantage 
or is the advantage only from interference as in implementations of Grover's algorithm as opposed to from entanglement as it is assumed in Shor's algorithm or is it something else? Okay, uh, this is of course a question um, quite heavily discussed uh, now in the community. My own personal opinion is that this is a classical system. But I want, for the defense of classical systems in this quantum seminar, I want to say that to find the ground state of a classical XY Hamiltonian, and this, this ground state will be classical, it will not be a superposition, is first a, a hard problem. So not all classical problems are easy. This is an anti-hard problem in general. And also it's interesting in the sense that you can map it to many useful problems. So the solution is classical, no question. Whether there's any quantum effects which help us to find the solution, my own personal opinion is no, but other people argue differently. Uh, I know that Yamamoto uh, has arguments that, of course, if you think about the state before you, you reach the threshold, this spontaneous emission say, uh, state, this is not a classical state. The classical state is only built after you cross the threshold, maybe a little bit after that. And the question is whether in this decision point, as Yamamoto calls it, as you cross the threshold, whether you can have some quantum effect or all the physics can be described by say Gaussian states or so. Uh, this is under heavy debate. I have my own personal opinion, but we'll have to wait a little bit. I know by the way, as, a, as an anecdote, that it turns out that the Japanese cabinet had to sit and make a decision whether this Ising machine is classical or quantum. And you can find in Google what they decided. I guess it's a question of funding. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, I will I will read one more question that relates to the to the last uh, part that you discussed here. Um, so how exactly does a pi phase difference uh, come about with the one hundred and minus one hundred degree phase difference in your triangular lattice case? Okay, this was a small point. I almost apologize for mentioning it, but we found it sort of curious because you don't expect to get a, a pi phase. So again, the answer is quite simple. You just, uh, I, I cannot do it on, on the screen, but you just have to think about two possible solutions uh, between a, a laser and its neighbor. One solution would go at uh, plus 120. The other one would be an error going at minus 120. If you sum up these two errors, you just get an error, which is 180. And the length of this error is half. And this is what uh, resulted in the coherence of half because it's the average, the length of this uh, coherent vector, and the value is 180, by the way, also in the Kagome. But once you understand it, it's not so you know, interesting. It just shows you the difference between a single realization and an ensemble average, and the ensemble average can give you this sort of uh, curious. Also the fact that the coherence function does not decay monotonically, which is the usual case, but revives every third neighbor is again, simply explained by this picture, but the first time we saw it, we were sort of puzzled. Okay, I think um, we leave the rest for, for later and uh, you go on. Okay. Okay. So, uh, thank you. So uh, I want to continue and I want to add another ingredient to the system to make it maybe a little bit more um, versatile or look a little bit more like a computer. So what we are going to do, we are going to introduce this digital laser and the way we digitize it, we replace one of the mirror with a spatial light modulator, which has a around a thousand by thousand pixels. So the first thing that we can do, we can kick out these annoying masks that I show you, triangular, kagome, square, and we can write the mask on the spatial light model. So this is an example where you use a quasi-crystal, and if you couple lasers on a quasi-crystal, you get these 10 diffraction orders, you can count them. Or we can, uh, uh, and then we could of course uh, choose to make masks which look like this person or like that person, and this we call the Einstein mode, and this we call the Newton mode, and, uh, and this gives you basically, you can control any distribution of spins or of continuous functions that you want. A another thing that the same, by the way, the spatial light modulator is quite expensive as many of you know, and to put it inside a laser resonator is a bit frightening. <laughs> uh, so we had to be very careful about that. And then after this work, we say, if we invested so much effort, let's the spatial light modulator work twice for us. So in addition to giving us the intensity distribution, it can also control the phase. Uh, I can write the phase uh, independently of each of the laser. By the way, writing the phase on the spatial modulator will actually change the frequency of this laser. So if you remember the Koromoto equation from before, it was the derivative of the angle 
is coupled to all the other angle, now I'm going to add this new term, which is disorder. So I can introduce a controlled amount of disorder to the frequency of each laser. Just imagine it if, you, if these were a couple spins, uh, then I, each spin would see a different uh, x, y spins, each spin would see a slightly different magnetic field. And of course, if the disorder goes up, it becomes more and more difficult to synchronize them. Is this is what happening? Let's see. So what I'm showing you here are three experiments. This is experiment you've already seen. I have about a thousand lasers, and uh, this is the far field. It's composed of these sharp diffraction peaks. Actually, uh, we even have the spatial light model work a little bit uh, more for us. When I said that the phase is zero, you actually first use the spatial light modulator to, co to correct a little bit of aberration that we have in the system. So it's like an adaptively corrected laser. And, and this is we call zero. And then after we do that, we add a random phase for each laser, say for each pixel. And as we increase the distribution, the width of this distribution, this is uniform distribution, we see that the quality of the phase locking degrades. So when you see here a larger diffraction peak, you know that the coherence lengths or the number of lasers which are phase locked become smaller than the size of the system. And as we introduce more and more disorder, we see that we destroy the coherence gradually until, until it's completely gone. And this we can quantify. We can look on the sharpness of these peaks, or if you want the coherence function as the measure of the uh, lock of the coherence of the system. So this is the coherence of the system, and this is the amount of disorder that we introduce. You see, without any disorder, we have one. The coherence is one, and then it goes down uh, gradually uh, until it goes down to zero when the disorder is quite large. And this is done for the nearest neighbor. We have other coupling methods which I will address soon, and one of them is actually long range coupling. So the coupling is uh, not just for each laser to its nearest or next nearest neighbor, but actually more close to all to all or near field. And when you do that, you see that the coherence also decay, but you see it decays in a different way. And this, there's maybe a hint here for a second order phase transition. If you do the simulation of the system, for the short range, you see this crossover. This is what you expect. And for the long range coupling, you actually have, expect to see the second order phase transition, which unfortunately we cannot claim to have proven, but there is a, at least a, a difference between them. So the fact that you have a second order phase transition between coupled oscillators within the Koromoto approximation, I remind you, this constant intensity approximation was actually discussed by many authors, but one of them which uh, took our attention, Areki, found out that for some parameters, and when you include the intensity as an unfrozen degree of freedom, you actually can get jumps, which it's called first order transitions. Although it's not completely agreed because it's not thermodynamic, but a jump would, we would call first order. And the question is, can we see these jumps when we unfreeze the intensity degree of freedom? So let me show you a, an example where you could see jump. And the example is motivated by this uh, uh, bridge, which is called the Millennium Bridge in London between St. Paul and the New Tate. It was inaugurated in the millennium, 2000. And for a few days, people walked on it and then they had to close it down, embarrassingly. And the reason they had to close it down is... I'll skip it a little bit. You see people, people walking on the bridge. And then at some point you see that the bridge starts to oscillate in a very annoying way. So it's annoying to walk on this bridge. So they closed it down. But then they, for three months, they let some physicists do experiments with people, and, and, the, and the physicists took more and more people on the bridge, sorry, and they found out that when you go above a critical number of people, you see a sharp transition in the bridge starts to so This was quite intriguing, and there is a very beautiful paper describing this phenomena. And we wanted to do this experiment with our lasers. So here, uh, here is the degenerate cavity that you've seen already, and we have these many lasers which are now uncoupled. So the pedestrians are uncoupled, but then we have another uh, setup, which is coupled somehow to this setup, and we have another laser, which we call the bridge laser, and the bridge laser is coupled to each one of the pedestrians, just like this bridge is coupled to the pedestrians, and then uh, it closes the loop and it mediates the interaction between the pedestrian, and this mediation is actually mean field, all to all, okay? And when we do this experiment with the laser, we change the number of lasers, like just like the number of people. And what I'm showing you here is what happens when you go from 42 lasers to 45. We just change the number of lasers by a little bit. And what you see that for 42 lasers, the far field looks like rather a big blob, maybe with a slight hint of a coherent peak. And for a slightly larger number, you see this sharp diffraction peak. So we get a jump of synchronization that we didn't see before. And when we quantify 
this uh, coherence in this axis as a function of the number of laser, we see this very sharp jump. We see a first order transition. And the reason we see this transition is because now the intensity does interesting things. In particular, just like the bridge starts to oscillate, this laser actually crosses threshold and you get this additional strong nonlinearity, which is not described by Koromoto model. So this is another example where the coupled laser equation are a richer physical system than the, the, the Koromoto. And this, for example, provides you this first order transition or jumps, okay? By the way, these jumps, uh, the position of this jump depends on some parameters and in particular on the strength of the coupling. Of course, the stronger the coupling, the weaker the number of people or laser you need in order to uh, uh, synchronize via the bridge. You cannot do that with real people, but with our lasers, we can control the coupling. And here we change the coupling and we found out for each value of the coupling, the value of the critical number of pedestrians or lasers that cross synchronization. And this fulfills nicely a power law actually for two types of array, the square array that I showed you and another array, which I didn't show you, which is a random array. And it turns out that this power law is actually not a standard power law. The, the standard power law from the Koromoto, for example, should have been minus one. And this is minus 2.4. And this agrees quite well with a numerical prediction done by uh, Roy and Ott uh, some years ago. So we have uh, uh, this example. Let me show you in a little bit more detail how we can couple the lasers all to all or how we can vary the coupling. So if you remember our system, we have the two mirrors, we have the mask of the laser and we have the telescope. What I'm doing now here, I'm putting in the far field of the laser, I'm putting a pinhole. If the pinhole is completely open, of course the lasers are uncoupled. And the way to see that is as the lasers are fully transformed here, because this is Fourier and multiplied by the mask, what you get is a convolution with the Fourier transform of the mask. So a big mask, the Fourier transform of it is a delta function, which means that the laser uh, coming from this is almost no diffraction by the pinhole. If I close the pinhole, now the full transform of this pinhole looks like this sink or jink in a circle. And that means that the laser coming from this uh, point as it goes back and forth is diffracted by the pinhole. So it's convulsed with the Fourier of the pinhole and it gives me this diffraction pattern. And you see, I chose the diameter of the pinhole going from, sorry, going from here to here, as I reduce the radius, this increases. So I stopped at the exact point where I get this minus sign. So this would give me negative coupling between nearest neighbor. And by the way, in a consistent way, positive, negative, positive, negative. So this will be a very long range negative coupling between the lasers. If I go to some intermediate incommensurate radius, I would get this oscillating coupling function. It's the Fourier transform of this. It's a long range oscillation because uh, the coupling goes as a power law, not exponential as before. And when the coupling is incommensurate with the laser with plus minus plus minus, you get something which is similar to Aubrey Andre, is a, in some sense similar to disorder. So we have a long range random coupling between laser, which actually means that we are uh, doing a spin glass and we have some interesting results with this system, which I do not have time to discuss today. Of course, if we go all the way and we close the system to a delta function, so for delta function, you can say that the diffraction of a delta function is very wide. So the light coming from each laser is diffracted by a delta function. It forgot where it came from and it returns to all the other laser and this gives us all to all coupling or mean field. And of course, mean field is a very strong coupler and you can see that this is how we got the record number of phase lock laser, which you can see by the sharpest peaks that I showed you, we are more than 5,000 coupled lasers with the mean field. But this is a bit tedious because you have to align things very, very carefully. You have this very sharp pinhole that have to be aligned very carefully. We were a little bit lazy and we ask, is there an easier way to couple all the lasers to each other? And the answer is yes. If instead of the pinhole, you put here a saturable absorber, it can act as a self-made pinhole in the following way. Think about the minimal loss solution. So if all the lasers will have the same phase, they would create this sharp diffraction point and the sharp diffraction point will have a high intensity and subtle absorbent when it sees a high intensity, it becomes transparent. So it will uh, make a pinhole. If we move it, the pinhole will move together and will be in a self-consistent way. In addition, of course, the subtle absorber can couple the longitudinal modes that I showed you before. So we have spatial effect and we have temporal effect. So let's start with the spatial effect. So we do it and it works. You see this sharp diffraction peak and clearly this 
minimize the loss of the system. It's a slow, smaller loss than if all the, the power would be spread over a large area, okay? And this is found. However, in some cases, we see this. This is zero, 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 the ferromagnetic order, and this is the anti-ferromagnetic order. It is also composed of sharp peaks. When you do the exact calculation, you see that these two losses, depending on the parameters of the satellite absorber, are almost degenerate. So the system you can choose this one or that one, both of them would be minimal loss. We can make another system where these two in phase and out of phase mode are degenerate. And this is what we see. And if you remember the reason why we see the two solutions combined, the in phase, this is the in phase and the out of phase is because of the multiplicity of solvers, the multiplicity of longitudinal modes. We have 500 longitudinal modes. So here half of them do this and half of them do the other like we saw with the triangle. But here no. Here in some realizations, all the 500 modes choose the in-phase solution or all the 500 modes choose the out-of-phase solution. One way to explain that is clearly that this combination is not as good as these ones because here the power is spread over more peaks so the intensity is smaller so the transparency of the saturated absorber is not as good. But how do the laser know to find this good solution? And the answer is because the satellite absorber also acts in the time domain or the frequency domain, and it basically couples all the modes. So now you don't have a single solver that finds a solution, even if it's out of phase, but all the solvers must find the same solution by the coupling between them in the time domain. Okay? And this is the explanation why they all choose this or they all choose this. Now the question is, if you have 500 solvers, and there is a little bit of noise, but you force them to find the same solution, will they do a better job in the presence of some noise? And the answer is definitely yes. So they find the same solution. So what I'm showing you here is a bit technically complicated. We changed the degeneracy parameter between the two solutions, the in-phase and the out-of-phase. There's a crossing point where they are exactly degenerate. But then as I go here, I expect the system to choose the right one. And this is the regular linear coupling where I showed you before that I have many solvers, many frequencies which are uncoupled. Some of them do this, some of them do this. And this is this nonlinear coupling with the saturation absorption where all the solvers find the same solution. And you can see this is much sharper. So the ability to distinguish between near degenerate solution is improved significantly when you introduce this new concept of nonlinear coupling. Okay. Um, in the last very few minutes, I want to come back to this a very general diagram and ask what is the difference between an easy problem and a hard problem. So in an easy problem, you have a single global ground state and it's easy even on your computer and our laser in, with equal ease find the ground state solution. However, in this case, you can get very easily stuck in a local minima. And what we did he, in this case, we put our 10 or 20 or 30 lasers on a ring and the ring has topology. And what that means is that if the, the ring found one of these local minima, which has a topological charge distinct, so the phase doesn't go zero, 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 but zero a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, until you get to two pi and you close the circle. This is not the ground state. This is not the minimal loss solution, but it is topologically protected. So you can get really stuck here. And, and the diffraction pattern, from the diffraction pattern, you can get to, to see if you're in the global minima or the local one. And we want to study the success rate of the system depending on parameters. So what I'm showing you here now is this failure rate. So small is good. This is a 10% failure. This is 50% failure. Failure means not to found the zero topological charge, which is the true ground state, but to get stuck in one of these metastable topologically protected vortices. And we do it as a function of the pump. And if you remember, you, see, you can see that as, as I reduce the pump and as I approach this threshold, which I also show you in the introduction, the system does a better and a better job. And there are several ways to explain it, but let me introduce another one. And the one comes from the intensity again. So it turns out that when we turn on the laser, this is the intensity of each laser as a function of time. So here you, you see the 20 laser and you see these fluctuations. They are very known, very famous. They are called relaxation oscillation. When you turn on the laser, the intensity fluctuates. It turns out this corresponds to a noise, a thermal bus. The degree of freedom of the intensity is coupled to the phase, which we are interested in, via this intensity fluctuation. So we have a temperature and the temperature depends on the amplitude. And as you can see, the temperature, these fluctuations relax in a time scale that we can control. Actually, it depends on the pump. So this is one time scale that we have in the system. The other time scale is, of course, how fast it takes for the phase to equalize along the system. So as you probably know, if you cross a phase transition, 
namely you try to go from unsynchronized to synchronized and you have two time scale governing the system, if you ramp the system down, the temperature down, which here happens effectively by ramping the intensity noise down, which you can control by the pump, you should do a better and better job. And this is called in general Kibel Zurek. So we have our own Kibel Zurek in our dissipative system. It's very, very different from the Kibel Zurek that many of us know, where you take a system like a bose einstein corner set and you cool it from the outside. Here the system dissipates itself, but still you can find a direct analogy of this Kibel Zurek concept. And one of the manifestation is that these two time scale, the phase time and the amplitude time, or if you want the cooling time and the order parameter or the correlation time, the ratio between them here with a strange power, which I, I, I don't have time to discuss, they do data collapse. So all the behavior of the system, all the success rate of the system to find a global ground state and not to get stuck in one of these topologically protected excited state depends on this ratio between two time scales. And with that, I want to finish. And just to remind you that uh, I showed you that we have a XY spin simulation sometime when the assumptions of uniform intensity are correct, and we can study various uh, orders like for a square, for Kagome, and for this quasi-crystal. I showed you that we have topology. This is something I didn't have time to discuss as I go gradually from closed ring to open ring. And you ask the question, for what residual coupling, weak link? The topology changes, and the answer is actually quite surprising, <laughs> uh, but I don't have time to discuss it. And I showed you that sometimes you have these first order transitions, for example, in the case of the crowd synchrony, say, motivated by the Millennium Bridge uh, nice uh, story. I didn't have time to show you these other problems as I expected. Uh, and this only leaves me time to show you the group. So the people with green, uh, with circles are the laser people. The other one are the cold atom people. And green are people that are here. Uh, red are people uh, that left. And, and this is my long-term collaborator, Asher Frizem. And I will end with this uh, picture, which shows that uh, this is a what happens when you put two masks in our laser cavity. One of them has the shape of the Superman and the other one has the shape of the Batman. And we impose the minimal loss solution. So the laser has to be consistent with being a Batman in one plane and a Superman in the other plane. So if you want to call you know, your hero, um, this is what you see. So with that movie, I uh, thank you very much for your attention and I finish my talk. Good, thank you, Nir, uh, for this really great talk. Um, and uh, we have a few more questions. So let me start again with Bill. The classification of phase transitions as first or second order, but depends somewhat of the quantity that is being monitored. For traditional thermodynamic transitions, this is usually well agreed upon so that this continuous heat capacity, for example, is first order. Is there a similarly uh, well-defined choice here, so in your out of equilibrium uh, case, or is there a, a, a met or out of thermal equilibrium case, or is there a matter of personal taste? I think the second is probably more correct. As, as I said, I try to be careful uh, that in, in this kind of system, uh, and I, uh, the transitions are not really phase transitions in the common thing. Uh, there are uh, variations. For example, uh, the Kibel Zurich uh, that I showed. Uh, is out of equilibrium, but you can actually find a sort of a adiabatic way to change the state of the system as you cross the phase transition. When you, under these conditions, which I did not show here, you can actually have a well-defined notion of second order transition. Uh, in the uh, crowd synchrony or the Millennium Bridge, uh, of course, I change a parameter in the system. So it's definitely not a, a, a thermodynamic phase transition. Uh, and, and the jump uh, is a first uh, transition, but it's not a phase transition. So I, I agree that, that you cannot really map these systems. Uh, in, in addition, we have to remember that this, these are these strongly over them dissipative system. So they are definitely non-Hermitian and the notion of temperature is not really well defined there. So you have to be careful with, uh, with uh, you know, impl implications to thermodynamics. But you can see continuous source, uh, uh, you can see transitions for the first derivative and for the second derivative. So in some analogy, you can use the word first and second order. Okay, so um, we have a question from Valentina Parigi. Um, and the question is, how exact should be the assumption that the intensity of the different lasers should be equal that you require for this mapping between the spins uh, uh, and, and the lasers? 
So is this, yeah. Um, okay, it's a bit of a technical graph, but uh, it, it's one example. It's not a representative because it's a small system. You see this Tittle House system. These are the lasers that are coupled with nearest neighbor negative coupling. And you can compare between the, the minimal loss solution of the laser, which in this particular case actually shuts down this laser completely because this laser is unhappy because all these lasers can be at zero pi. So they are extremely happy. And this laser has to choose some value between zero and pi. So the minimal loss solution of the laser would shut down this laser completely, especially when you're close to threshold. On the other hand, if you look on the XY, you get these strange different values. So you can see these phases and these phases differ from each other because of the non-uniformity of the laser, even in this very simple system, the lasers themselves are exactly uniform. So the difference in intensity doesn't come from the property of the laser, but rather from the property of the, uh, of the coupling. What we did, as I hinted before, we actually had a feedback loop which forced the laser to have the same intensity. And, and this is manifested here. And in this graph, which summarized, so this is the, the non-uniformity of intensity, which is a combination of what we impose to equalize them and what the non-uniform coupling does. And this is the difference between the laser, the, what, what the laser do and what the XY predicts. So zero is good. And as you can see that, for example, for already 10% non-uniformity between the laser, which would not, you would not see in the picture, you get actually significant differences between the laser system and the XY. This is not an exact, I didn't define this scale exactly, but you know, one is a disaster. So already for 10% difference, you get like only an approximated solution. And then you can ask, of course, what is the goal? If the goal is to find the absolutely exact ground state, then you cannot allow anything. If you want to get a good approximation, then you can allow a small uh, difference in intensity. Okay. Um, another question by uh, Yaniv Kurman. Uh, and the question was about uh, your topological um, couplings uh, that can lead then uh, to topological um, states where the system is uh, in. And the question is, can you basically now use um, SLM added randomness noise uh, to basically test that the system is topologically stable? Um, I'm thinking out. Yeah, the answer is, of course, yes, we can do it. Um, and the uh, the second question is, did we did it? So not quite. We did something which is similar, but it's, it's a bit too technical. But uh, let's, let me just say that it's def the, the way this will be manifested, of course, is that if I start to introduce a, a dis disorder to this system, it will stay in this basing. Of course, the fact that something is topologically protected, it means that this minima cannot adiabatically converge to this minima, but it will be locally distorted. So we will not get immunity of the exact phase, but we will, uh, we will be able to show that even a rather large distortion does not change this minima to that minima. Uh, in particular, that the topological charge is protected. And this we show in simulation, and as I said, a bit indirectly also in experiment. Okay, then one last question by Andrew Daly. Um, and that is uh, about the connection of your lasers to exciton systems. So uh, in reference to exciton systems, some people cite that uh, the process of locking, which is condensation in that case, is not fully understood and could be non-classical, uh, well, which means quantum. Uh, can you identify something similar in the locking on the lasers in your models? So I think the answer is, is the following. Uh, at the final readout state where the, the, one of the solutions is macroscopically populated, I think we will all agree that the lasers are simply described by, by a coherent state. There are uh, arguments and some disagreements about the exact state below threshold uh, and the exact transition of the threshold. There are some uh, theory paper, there are some indirect evidence that quantumness plays a role there. Uh, for example, there's a notion uh, pushed by Yamamoto of some uh, uh, intermediate uh, squeezing or intermediate uh, even entanglement. But there are, I, as far as I know, there are no experimental evidence for that in either system. So I would say that there's no proof that there's anything quantum either in the laser system or in the exciton system. In that sense, we're equal. OK, um, then thank you again. Uh, for the talk and uh, for answering uh, all the questions. Um, and uh, I will hand over to Sebastian, I think.
Okay, well, Nir, thank you very much for a cool talk. I certainly learned a lot of new things. I think this was very interesting. And uh, if you guys think these talks are interesting, we would ask you to contribute some. So we ha would like to remind you of our very first Young Researcher session on November 5th, where we will have three short talks by you guys, right? And uh, if you have done something new and cool, you should tell us about it. So go to the nomination page on our website and uh, have a look at the details. And if you have not already sent us an email, please do so by October 5th. Next week, we'll have uh, Pete Schmidt, who will talk about something very different again. It's going to be about quantum logic spectroscopy with uh, trapped ions. And if you want to get notified about what we do, please go to our website, quantumscienceseminar.com. You subscribe to our email list, our Google Calendar. You can follow us on Twitter. And you should certainly also check out our sister seminar, the virtual AMO seminar, where tomorrow, Anya Yaich will be speaking about quantum sensing with color centers in diamond. And uh, if you'd like to join us for a um, question and answer session with Nir, you should uh, take a look at the Zoom link I just posted on the YouTube chat and um, join us here in a few minutes. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your interest and hope to see you again uh, next week, same time, same place. Bye.